Well, hello, my YouTube fellas and gals. So, today we are on lot eight of my action and suspense card backs, and these are all for sale. And if you are a first time person to my channel, I own a used bookstore, a Nurban this bookstore, and more on Facebook, or you can contact me through Tammy's Makeup Treats at gmail.com. Let me know the name of the author or the ISBN number, which I will list everything below the book you're interested in. And I will mail it medium mail, which is the cheapest mail for books. Also, if you're not into buying real books, but you like reading off of the Kindle or a Nook, you can look these books up. And I get to read the synopsises, so you might be interested in some of the books that I read about. So with that, book number one. This is called Conquerors of the Sky by Thomas Fleming. Oh, and by the way, I put them on my Etsy store site too, so you can get linked to go get them. Or I can give you the name to my Etsy store to pick them up. By Thomas Fleming, it's a 2003 copyright. This is what the book looks like. This is what it's about. When Alan Van Ness, the magnetic chairman of Buchanan Airport, dies of a heart attack, a smuggle or a struggle for control out of the aerospace giant erupts between Burley Dickstone, the tough talking money man from New York, and the Californian Cliff Morris, CEO and super salesman. Sarah Morris, Child Cliff's estranged English-born wife, knows all the company's secrets. With her at work at the controls, Conquerors of the Sky becomes a time trip to the early years of the 20th century, when flight was seen as spiritual ascent and idealistic Frank Buchanan began designing planes. New York aristocrat Adrian Van Ness is equally fascinated by these new machines as a financial bonanza. In 1930, Adrian's amoral business genius and Frank's visions of the ever swifter and sleeker planes from the basis of the precarious alliance soon became an aircraft is competing with Lockheed and Boeing in Northrop for contracts to build airlines and bombers and fighters. As corrupt connections between generals and congressmen and presidents multiply, Frank sees some of the greatest planes scuttled by dirty political deals. We have a singer in the background, too, by the way. A cricket. <laughs> he watches Adrian grow rich and powerful, preaching the gospel of air power in the century's wars. When Dick Stone joins Buchanan, he sees Adrian as his American father, but he soon shifts his spiritual alliance to Frank Buchanan. Cliff Morris's flamboyant style concedes, conceals a ruinous moral collapse in the deadly skies over World War II Germany. His fear of discovery is worsened by the sardonic shadow of his stepbrother, Billy McCall, the supreme pilot Cliff, will never become. Sarah loves all three men ultimately has to choose between them. Knowing that in the macho world of Buchanan aircraft, women are objects to be enjoyed or used to sell the latest bomber airliner. For women like Amanda Van Ness, Adrian's wife, and Frank Buchanan's lover, this leads to madness for Sarah. It leads to power at a terrible price. Speeding the history of flight from the clumsy fabric planes of 1911 to the whizzing stealth fighters of today, Conquerors of the Sky is a page-turning drama of a struggle to match aerodynamic visions with the harsh realities of cash flow and profits with the desires and dreams of men and women who inhabit the unique world told by a master of historical imagination. It is a must-read book that will launch America into a celebration of the 100th anniversary of life. So there is book number one. Sounds interesting. Book number two is The Appeal by John Grisham. This is the 2008 copyright. That's what the book looks like. And this is what it's about. 
In a crowded courtroom in Mississippi, a jury returns a shocking verdict against a chemical company accused of dumping toxic waste into a small town's water supply, causing the worst cancer cluster in history. The company appeals to the Mississippi Supreme Court, whose nine justices will one day either approve the verdict or reserve it. Who are the nine? How will they vote? Can one be replaced before the case is ultimately decided? The chemical company is owned by Wall Street predator named Carl Trudeau, and Mr. Trudeau is convinced the court is not friendly enough with judicial elections looming. He decides to try to purchase himself a seat on the court. The cost is a few million dollars, a drop in the bucket for a billionaire like Mr. Trudeau. Through an intricate web of conspiracy and deceit, his political operatives recruit a young unsuspecting candidate. They finance him, manipulate him, market him, and mold him into a potential Supreme Court justice. Supreme Court justice. The appeal is in a powerful, timely, and shocking story of political and legal intrigue, a story that will leave readers unable to think about their electoral process or judicial system in quite the same way ever again. So there you go. Book number two. Book number three. We have The Fig Eater by Jody Shields. This is a 2000 copyright. This is what the book looks like. And this is what it's about. Vienna 1910. Freud's Vienna, a city of horse-drawn carriages, masked balls, and gaslit Cafe Hoover's over the threshold between darkness and light, superstition and science. The murder of Dora, the haunted daughter of a respectable Burgoris family, is being investigated by the inspector newly schooled in rationalist criminology. Almost every aspect of the case remains hidden untouchable he recognizes uncertainty as part of solving the crime and knows that what is unspoken remains most powerful he is trying to find the error in the situation that small link that will lead him to the truth his wife errs to bed in a hungarian steeped in the intuition of the lore of gypsy mysticism becomes obsessed with the murder and launches her own parallel secret investigation. She is sure that the figs found in Dora's stomach are the clue to the identity of the murderer, for there are fresh figs in Vienna at this time of the year. With the help of young British governess, she unmasked the enti entirely other face of the crime and of society that would prefer it to be repressed forever. In her brooding, atmospheric, and meticulously researched de debut thriller, Jody Shields resurrects turns of the century Vienna with luscious details about food, botany, and fashion, descriptions of perverse medical practices, and hints at sexual secrets. The Fig Eater is a great suspense puzzle in which each piece gathered challenges other perceptions and leads us to the novel shocking climax. So there is book number three. Book number four. We have Capital Crimes by Stuart Woods. This is a 2003 copyright. It's what the book looks like. And this is what it's about. Capital Crimes is a third thrilling featuring Will Lee, a courageous and uncompromising politician from Georgia and one of Stuart Woods' most memorable and dynamic characters. Lee introduced in the Edgar award-winning chiefs has been the center of some of wood's most beloved books including the bestsellers the run grassroots and run before the wind in capital crimes lee again finds himself in the middle of a tangled web of intrigue and danger Pol politics and power now at the pinnacle of his career serving as president of the united states lee is faced with the most unusual task that of marshalling federal law enforcement agencies to cash an assassin who is picking off some of the nation's high-level politicos. 
When a prominent conservative politician with a shady reputation is expertly killed in his lakeside cabin, authorities can come up with no suspects, even less than even less hard evidence. But then within days, two other seemingly isolated deaths achieved by very different means are feared linked to the same ruthless murderer. With the help of his CIA director wife, Kate Rowley, Will trails the most clever and professional of killers before he can strike again from a quiet D.C. suburb to the corridors of power of to a deserted island hideaway. Will Kate and Maverick FBI agent Robert Kinney track their man and set a trap with extreme caution and care and await the most dangerous kind of quarry, a killer with a cause to die for? Capital Crimes is another electrifying edge of your seat thriller from a masterful store at Woods. So there is book number four. Book number five. The Hangman's Song by John Sanford. This is a 2003 copyright. This is what the book looks like. This is really cool. It's like all indented feeling. And this is what it's about. And now here they are, the Hangman song. A super hacker friend of kids named Bobby suddenly disappears from cyberspace and kid knows that it isn't a good sign. Then when he goes to Bobby's house, kid finds him dead on the floor, his head bashed in and his laptop missing. And kid knows that really ain't a good sign. Really isn't a good sign. The secrets on the laptop are, laptop are potent enough to hang Kid and everybody else in Bobby's circle just to start with. So there's no question that Kid and Lou Ellen have to try to track it down. Not to mention that Kid would clearly love to get his hands on the man who killed Bobby. But before Kid can get very far, the secrets start coming out anyway. And they're more staggering than even he had imagined because it's not just about the lives of the circle of friends and colleagues now oh no it's about something much much bigger and much much scarier filled the atmosphere characters and exceptional drama that have made john sanford one of the most america's beloved thriller writers so there you go book number five book number six we have Pleading Guilty by Scott Turo. This is a 1993 copyright. That's what the book looks like. I like, I like how he's got the little squiggle for his signature. And this is what it's about. Kendall County, where skies are generally gray and the truth is seldom simple, is one of the most renowned and fascinating locales in contemporary American fiction. In pleading guilty, Scott Turner takes us there again at the edge of the chair's story, rife with inedible characters and riveting suspense. 1993's most unforgettable reading experience. Our guide is McCormick, a Mac. Our guide is McCormick A. Mac Malloy, 50-ish ex-cop, almost ex-drunk, and partner on the way in at Cage. And Gage and Griswell, one of Kendall County's top-notch law firms, who has been charged with the firm's oversight committee with a highly sensitive task. Bert Kamen, G and G's gifted, erratic, impossible, combat combative, combat combative, combative, combative <laughs> star litigator. Has been missing for weeks. Also missing is $5.6 million from a fund established to settle a massive air disaster class action suit against Transnational Airlines, the world's largest carrier and G&G's biggest client. The committee needs Mac to find Bert in the money immediately. The search takes us to the inner sanctums of G&G where Mac's close to the best partners, among them his good friend and sometime bedmate, Amelia Brushy Borussia, jockey and plot. He ventures into the dark heart of the city itself to the Russian bath of the far west end where the mysterious Cam Roberts has left tracks. 
Before long, he runs up against his former beat partner, longtime nemesis, an odious pig eyes and a cold corpse. Mac is foul-mouthed, expansive, and sensual. Weighed down by a profound familiar, familiar, I can't even say that word, blurp, <laughs> familiar air, familiarity with the ways of the world and his own ineradicable weaknesses, yet blessed with an incorrigible black Irish sense of humor. He carries secrets of his own and knows that as the police are found, fond of saying, there are no victims, lovable, unreliable, a master sleuth, and an inti imitatable guide to an ominous and thrilling world. He may well be Scott Turo's supreme fictional creation to date. Boy, was that a mouthful. <laughs> so there's book number six. Ugh, book number seven. We have... A is for Alibi, B is for Burglar, C is for Corpse by Sue Grafton. So we have yet three more novels in one. This is a 1999 copyright. Nice thick book. That's what it looks like. And this is what it's about. A is for Alibi, Grafton's Lawrence Fife was a slick divorce lawyer and a notorious ladies man until someone decided enough was enough and killed him. A jury was convinced that that someone was his pretty young wife, Nikki, and sent her to prison for eight years. Now she's out and hires Kinsey Milhone to find the real killer. The trial may be eight years cold, but it twists and turns right up to the present with a brand new corpse and a brand new murder to solve. B is for burglar. The wealthy widow, Elaine Bolt, was last seen leaving her California condo wearing an expensive fur coat on her way to her condo in Boca Raton, Florida. Not sure if I pronounced that right. Blurp. When the fur coat turns up without its owner, Kinsey is hired by editor's sister to find her. What Kinsey thought would be an easy missing persons case turns out to be much more complicated and dangerous with arson, burglary, and murder. Make that more than one. C is for corpse. After the car forced his Porsche over the bridge of a canyon, battering his body and muddling his memory, Bobby Callahan is desperate for clues about his past and why someone will want to try to kill him. He meets Kinsey in the local gym and hires her to protect him. He was scared, scared to death, but it wasn't fear that killed him. A few days later, Kinsey had hired on to stop a killing. She hadn't been able to do that, but she'd find the killer or she'd die trying. So there you go. Book number seven. Book number eight is actually G is for gumshoe, H is for homicide, I is for innocent. Three complete novels by Sue Grafton. This is a 2002 copyright. That's what the book looks like. Nice and thick. Another three novels in one. We have G is for gumshoe. A rich, complex, and gripping tale in which Kinsey Grit is tested to its utmost as she unearths the gruesome truth about a long-buried betrayal and in the process comes face-to-face -face with the grisly fact of her own mortality. G is for guilt and guile, for greed and grief. In The Grim Reaper, this book that propelled Sue Grafton, Grafton to New York Times bestseller status. H is for homicide. To the cost... It looked like a robbery gone sour to Kinsey Milhone. It looked like the cops were walking away from the case. When she investigates the murder of a colleague and sometimes drinking companion, one of his open files leads her to scam artist Bibiana Diaz. She's on the run from her short-tempered, often violent ex-fiance, Raymond Maldonado, whose plans 
entangle both women and he doesn't like to take no for an answer. You might say that Kinsey becomes a prisoner of love. I is for innocent. Five years ago, David Barney walked when a jury acquitted him of a rich waste murder, asked to pick up the pieces of the new investigation to the crime. Kinsey is surprised by the less than credible witnesses and the strength of the suspect's claims. But it didn't kill his wife, who on the long list of candidates did. Isabel Barney had stepped on a toe, a lot of toes, somewhere out there a killer waits to see what Kinsey will find out. So there you go. There is book eight. These are big books. Book number nine. I believe I had this in a bigger size early on, but this is a different one. This is Barbara Ta or Emma's Secret by Barbara Taylor Bradford. This is a 2004. It's a smaller book. Copyright. That's what the book looks like. This is what it's about. Paula O'Neill, beloved granddaughter of Emma Hart and the guardian of her vast business empire, believes that everything Emma left to the family is secure. However, beneath the surface, sibling rivalry and discontent flare. Lynette and Tessa, her daughter, are as different as two women can be. One of them wants desperately for the empire to be hers, but has a devastating secret that may put her very life in danger. Into this volatile mix walks Evan Hughes, a young American fashion designer who is looking for Emma Hart. But Anna has been dead for 30 years, and Evan bears an uncanny resemblance to Paula O'Neill. Troubled by Evan's presence, Paula turns to her granddaughter's recently discovered wartime diaries to find the truth, and Emma comes vividly back to life. The decades fall away. It is London 1940, the Blitz. Emma, working hard under wartime conditions, is also holding her family together as bombs drop. Sirens wail and her sons go off to war. While she struggles with grief, her indomitability, willpower, strength come to the fore. As the pages unfurl, Paula discovers the secret Emma took to the grave to protect others. A secret whose repercussions inevitably change lives and may shake a dynasty to its very foundations. So there's book number nine. Book number ten... We have You is for Undertow by Sue Grafton. This is a 2009 copyright. This is what the book looks like. This is what it's about. It's April 1988, a month before Kinsey Milhorn's 38th birthday, and she's alone in her office catching up on paperwork when a young man arrives unannounced. He has a preppy air about him and looks as if he'd be carded if he tried to buy a beer. But Michael Sutton is 27, an unemployed college dropout. More than two decades ago, a four-year-old girl disappeared in a recent newspaper story about her kidnapping has triggered a flood of memories. Sutton now believes he stumbled on her lonely burial and could identify the killers if he saw them again. He wants Kinsey's help in locating the grave and finding the men. It's way more than a long shot, but he's persistent and willing to pay cash up front. Reluctantly, Ken Kinsey agrees to give him one day of her time, but it isn't long before she discovers Sutton has an uneasy relationship with the truth. In essence, he's the boy who cried wolf. Is his true story or simply one more in a long line of fabrications? Moving effortlessly between the 1980s and the 1960s, and changing points of view as Kin Kinsey pursues witnesses whose accounts often clash, Grafton builds multiple subplots and creates memorable characters. Gradually we come to see how everything connects in this twisting, compelling, surprise-filled thriller, and as always, at the beating heart of her fiction is Kinsey Milhorn, a sharp-tongued, observant learner who never forgets that under the thin veneer of civ civility, is a roiling dark side to the soul. So there we go. There is book number 10. And I hope whatever time zone you're in, you're having a great time. Don't forget, everything's in the description below. And I'll see you soon. Bye.